you've got a crowd of hecklers already. Um, it's my pleasure for, to uh, introduce you this evening, this afternoon, to Chad Seaman, internet dumpster diver, DDoS researcher, hunter of botnets, diddler of malware, and senior security response team engineer at Akamai. Presenting with him is Rory Smith, computer and caffeine addict, packet ninja, log crawler, and first line of defense against large-scale web app and DDoS attacks targeting your favorite companies, also known as the senior SOC engineer specialist at Akamai. Hey guys, thanks for having us. Uh, the talk we're going to give today is the YRX botnet and how shady apps lead to hot pockets. And we'll hand it off to Rory first. All right. Hey, everybody. Pretty much here, we have a nice and interesting attack to kind of bring in. I want to just take the time and bring you all into the sack. You're going to become one with us. You're going to feel our pain, the pressures on every point of this, and pretty much show you how we work through it. So. If you've ever worked in a SOC, you're going to feel like this is another day in the office. If you haven't, well, just get ready. You're about to get strapped in and engage. So on August the 17th, we had pretty much a slew of attacks, right? And it targeted all of our hospitality customers. So what's interesting about this attack is that, you know, you're working in a SOC, you get to know someone's infrastructure. You get to tune it accordingly. You want to protect them proactively. We always want to go towards a proactive solution. But in this case, normal mitigation methods didn't work. None of our proactive solutions worked. What was also interesting is that even our detection methods didn't work, right? So, and then after that, for some of our customers, you know, we have advanced mitigation methods, depending on the solution that they have, and those also failed. So now we're missing a lot of information. Now we're unable to detect it, we're unable to mitigate it proactively, and that's what we walk into starting the day. So what's so special about YRX, right? So what we're looking on is 70,000 unique IP addresses, right? So 70,000 infected devices connected at one time. And I think they're still being a bit modest because we saw quite a few more, but we're gonna go ahead and just hold it at 70,000. And these addresses, they result primarily to mobile networks. Not always, because you know you may have your phone and it's connected on the Wi-Fi. It's not necessarily always mobile, but one of the trends that we saw with it later on is that it was definitely mobile networks. Geographically, now that was completely dispersed. Again, we have 100 countries here. However, at actually being there on the ground looking at it, we saw 172 plus. So definitely more, and it bypassed all our standard security anomaly detections that we had in place, it bypassed proactive control methods, and it also even bypassed our basic JavaScript real browser challenges. So whatever this bot was, it, they knew what they were doing. These attackers knew what they were building and what they were targeting. And then now, let's go back, we're in the sack, and we're finding the mushroom cloud. So the title says it all, because you're in, you're sitting down, your phone rings, and the first call is, we've got a SEV1. Critical business infrastructure is impacted. Website's down. Right now, we're making no money. Here's a bridge. Get on it. We need your help now. No warning. You know you love those blind calls. You're going into it blind. You get on, and you know you're, we're all seasoned socks now. So we're going through our logs. What can we see? What can we find? Right, so we're looking on, let's say we have our mod security rules, we've got our snort rules, we've got everything engaged and we're checking, no triggers. We've got rate controls, no triggers. So at this point, it's, hey, uh, did somebody on your side do some maintenance? Maybe, up, maybe you tried, contact your system team, did they try to update something and bring down your app? We see that a lot, but maybe that's what's going on. So we say, okay, while, Everybody is engaged and doing their thing. Let's actually go on the traffic side. What does traffic look like? Usually someone's network operations may, the, may perform those tasks since you won't really go to a SOC and just say all the traffic. So we know that business is impacted and it's going down. So if there was an attack capable of bringing it down, we must be able to see it in traffic, right? So we started looking at, let's say, the hits per second to the site. Now, fairly popular site, so it has its usual 250 to 500 per second logs usually. 
and then immediately we see 20,000, right? So that's 20,000 per second, millions of logs per minute now being filled. And some customers, to their benefit, they were actually able to stay up. Their server logs were 70%, 80%, their CPUs, and other customers, they were completely down. So now, whatever this is, it can do 20,000 per second, and at the same time, not trigger an alert. That's weird on the security side. So we decided, let's go ahead and look on your valid traffic. Let's see what's actually in those logs right now. Not really an easy task from our side, since from the security perspective, we want to go ahead and what we do is we tag it as malicious, and then we, get, we want to preserve those headers. Because just if you go into your Apache log, you're going to get some details. Headers aren't preserved, right? So once we get that going, maybe on your SAC, you may have a TCP dump that you can open it and see it live. We see that well, pretty much the traffic looks fairly well, with the exception of the user agent. Looking on that user agent, we can see 26 characters randomly strung together, right? So when you're in the logs, it's clear as day. Now, when a IDS is looking at it, it's a unique IP and a unique user agent. So it's treating that as unique traffic, right? So nothing to see here. Maybe it's just a marketing campaign, and that's why their traffic doubled, right? So now we can, we can identify it. That's no problem. Let's, let's build some more profile around it, right? So we've got get floods, post requests, and get requests. We already identified the user agent and that the IPs were all unique. Now the rate is interesting. They're getting brought down. However, looking through the logs, we have a lot of IP addresses. We were clocking it at maybe three requests per second per IP address at near its peak. Now that's definitely territories where if you go rate control, you're going to hit legitimate traffic. So from there, and I'll go into the next line a little bit later, because the attacker appeared to be actively monitoring, which we'll cover in a second. And overall, the volume of traffic was high enough to, Im to impact your infrastructure, right? So these are what we know. Now, fairly easy. We've got 26 character user agents. We've got some pretty decent regex skills going on. So let's just drop this one, right? This is basic, right? So we're just saying A to Z, 26. Make sure you put that dollar sign in the end. But for some mitigation appliances, some of our clients, let's say, they don't just have one domain, right? They have maybe 10, 15 domains. And that is really popular domains. You don't want to just use regex that can be computationally expensive. So you don't want to be inspecting on everything. We just want to cut that traffic first. So we figured out the domain from the logs before, and we already saw that we had get and post requests. So let's just make a rule. Pretty much those are the criteria there, and pretty easy. Now, attack mitigated, beautiful. Everybody is happy, right? So attacks mitigated, servers are back, CPU levels are great, website stable, customers now awesome and ready to get back to business, and then the site goes down again. And now we're wondering, hey, what's going on? This is weird. So then we start looking on the logs again. We're already mitigating some. Now they're playing with the length. And then taunting us now. So they're like, oh, you know what? We'll go ahead and throw digits in there too. What are you going to do next? Right? So again, we, we know what good user agents look like. We know what bad. We know what characters to expect, what characters not to expect. And we can go ahead and start making more regexes. Now, after that, every time we made it, they change it. And then, of course, they went over to, what are you going to do when we hit you with legitimate user agents? Right? So now we're getting legitimate. So now this is, this is ours going now, because we've got whack-a-mole going. Now we've got pretty much you know, uh, legitimate user agents, which we can't just make a custom rule to drop. So now we've got to get more proactive. Because in this point, we have a case where our customers are saying, Every time you make a rule, you fix the problem, but between each of your rules, we're feeling impact, and it's getting really bad. So at this point, again, you know, our advanced mechanisms, they're not working, because this is, whatever this is, it's currently bypassing those. So we've got to use our oldies but goodies, and we've got to pretty much just lower the levels, right? So we had to use multiple controls after this, right? We have geoblocks aggressive rate controls, network lists, and each of which, well, combined, it definitely mitigated the problem, 
individually each had their own set of problems. So let's say we start with a blacklisting. This is hospitality. So some of our customers say, hey, we've got a global presence. People buy tickets from us all over the world. People want to stay in hotels and they come from all over to book. We can't just go and block countries randomly. You're going you're gonna to cost us money. So those, this wouldn't be a great option, right? But for other customers, they're like, hey, you know what? Most of our income is coming from the US or Europe. Right now, I've got zero dollars coming in. Let's go ahead and block everybody else. Then we used aggressive rate controls. We said over, overall we were seeing three requests per second, right? So on average, three requests per second. So legitimate users can pretty much trigger a three requests per second easy. However, do you expect it to sustain over five seconds? Do you expect it to sustain over a minute or two minutes? So should a legitimate user be doing three requests per second for two minutes? That's definitely not expected at that point. So we could get more aggressive with our rate controls, tuning accordingly. And from there, for some of our customers, that resulted in some legitimate client impact. Others, of course, had no impact. So this was definitely a good one. But again, if we have two customers getting dropped as opposed to everybody being unable to access a site, this is effective and acceptable to them. And then we had network lists, right? So network list, it was great at the start. You need something immediate. You need to shave off some of those top talkers and get that site a little less load. But this was exhaustive, super exhaustive. When you're pulling logs and you're pulling logs and you have 50,000 lines of code with 30,000 different IPs, you can imagine how exhaustive that must get to even add them to a list. And even when you think about it, we did see this as a mobile network, so if you think about your drive here, your flight here, you may have changed IP addresses 10 times, right? And conservative, so 10 times, in which case one infected IP could do 10 IP address, attack it from 10 different IP address. This was super temporary. But if they're feeling the impact, we're engaged, and of course we're using every tool at our disposal. So from a combination of those three, we're able to pretty much mitigate the attack, make our custom rules as well, and tune as needed. If they called in and said, hey, our customers are impacted, then you know we would go figure out a way, maybe increase the threshold a bit, and make sure that the load that they're seeing on their side isn't too much, and pretty much just go on. And from there, we got them through the hard part of this attack, right? So now that that's done, we, we just go ahead and call our cert team, or Chad here, and I'm like, hey, Chad, this is a botnet. It's super annoying, and we've been dealing with this all weekend. Interesting thing, looks like it's coming from mobile networks. Go ahead and check it out. This is where I come in. Yes! Love botnets. They're the best. I always love finding a new botnet. It's always a good day. Um, it sucks for the internet, but it's a lot of fun for me. So, this sounds especially interesting as soon as I get any details from it, and I'm just like, give me the data, give me what we need, let's start digging. Now, before I go any further, uh, there are some things that led up to the discoveries that we'll talk about that I can't talk about. Uh, just as supposedly Napoleon said, never interfere with your enemy when he's making a mistake. Uh, the developer of the malware made mistakes. I wanna talk about those mistakes, but they are eventually what led us to finding uh, the APKs and everything else that found the botnet or made us uncover the botnet. So, one of the mistakes resulted in some random characters ending up in some of the attack traffic that looked fairly unique. Uh, unique enough that when you drop them into Google, you found APKs associated with them hosted on these APK mirroring sites. Now, if you're not familiar with APK mirroring sites, uh, essentially they just crawl the Play Store and they snapshot everything, pull down the APK files that would be hosted there copy the descriptions, copy the developer pages, everything, uh, and serve as a backup, if you will, kind of like a, an APA, APK archive. So if your favorite app gets pulled from the App Store, 
you can probably still go find the APK and then load it from an unknown source uh, directly from here. They also, uh, if, if they push a new version, everybody was all up in arms about the new Snapchat. Well, you could have went and got your old Snapchat back from these guys probably, stuff like that. So that's what they're for. This turned into quite the rabbit hole. Um, we had a couple instances from the attacker's mistakes that led us to a couple pages, which in turn led us to their developer page as it was captured by the mirroring sites, which led us to the other apps, which led us to more apps and more apps and more apps. Uh, I don't think you can really see it in the screenshot here, but like this Google is for TubeMate 2.2.9, SnapTube, YouTube, Downloader R. And you find that we've got listings from APK Pure, we've got listings from oneapk.co, and there were a bunch of others. So it was a lot of just going and hopping from one of those to the next and, and grabbing all the APKs we could find that seemed relatively unique. So now we've got all of these APKs, and I am not an Android developer, and I've never reversed anything on an Android device. So now the hunt begins as to how can we start to handle this? And this is where APK tool comes in. Thank God for APK tool. It is amazing. Uh, and if you are looking into malicious APK files or malicious Android applications, you should definitely look into it. This is straight off its website, a tool for reverse engineering third-party closed binary Android apps. It can decode resources to nearly original form and rebuild them after making some modifications. It also makes working with an app easier because of the project-like file structure and automation of some repetitive tasks. They also have a disclaimer that please don't use it for piracy because you can totally use it for piracy, it's that good. Um, we, we don't know if the developer that launched this malware used this, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did because it allows you to basically decompile an app and then recompile that same app from the decompiled source that you got from the first decompilation and you can modify it, hence piracy. Um, if you wanna find more info, you can just Google it. Uh, if you're on OS X, you can literally install it from Brew, super easy. Uh, it's also available in most of your package management stuff on all of your favorite Linux distros, so it's awesome. So this is a quick example of using APK tool. You can see here we have TWDLPHGQ, whatever. That is one of the APKs that was pulled down, obviously, from apkpure.com. And this is just the basic decompilation process. It couldn't get literally any easier. APK tool D, file name, and the result is a directory named after the app. So we go into that directory, and there's a lot of files in there. There's 2,422 files in there. That's quite concerning, considering it's one tiny APK. Um, and the, the big problem is that we have to dig through this stuff to figure out if these APKs, this is one APK. At this point, I think we had close to two dozen. And each of them were producing thousands and thousands and thousands of files. So the important part here is that APK tool produces a folder called Smalley. All of these Smalley files are text files which becomes important for the next steps. Now the problem is, if we look at how many lines of code we actually have from Smalley, across our 2,400 files and directories, we have 380,000 lines of code, also a nightmare. Um, I don't wanna dig through 3, 380,000 lines of code trying to find, uh, to figure out if this is a malicious app or this is just some guy doing piracy. So that's a lot of hay. How can we find some needles? Uh, first thing, why is there so much Smalley? There's so much Smalley because APK tool doesn't know where your app ends and the Android core libraries and, and everything else begins. So we can see here, you've got Android support annotation, Android support v4 accessibility services, Android 4 support animation, app view, then we have v7 app, internal widget. So there's all this stuff that comes out and a lot of it is just junk that you can ignore safely. The good news is, is because this stuff's written in Java and Java utilizes proper namespaces for libraries and everything else, 
it does you the favor of saying, hey, this is all the Android stuff from the Android namespace, and this over here is all the other stuff from all the other namespaces. In this case, we know the app was called TWDL whatever, and if we look in the actual Smalley structure, we see a com, and then we see a TWDLPH whatever, and then we see an app. Now, if you're actually writing Java, you probably are familiar with import com dot your library name dot whatever path you want to go down. So when uh, APK tool does the decompilation, it actually, like they say, it, it maintains a sane application structure for your project for recompilation and management purposes. When it does the decompilation, it does the same thing. So looking into just these folders or this folder where we suspect the primary nefarious stuff is happening because it's very unlikely that he's backdooring stuff into the Android libraries. It's possible, I guess, but it's unlikely. Um, we find 2,451 lines of code. So, sorry, 24,000 lines of code. So, much more manageable than 380,000. So, what is Smalley? Like a pirate? No. Not like, well, it can be used for piracy, so maybe a little bit like a pirate. Uh, Smalley slash back Smalley is an assembler disassembler for the DEX format used by Dalvik, Android's Java VM implementation. Syntax is literally based on Jasmine's Dedexer syntax, supports the full functionality of the DEX format, including annotations, debugging information, line information, etc. I don't know what that means either. So what does this really mean in plain English? Uh, you can take Java, Dex, Dalvik bytecode, it will process it and it will convert it into this Smalley language, which is basically an ASCII representation of Java bytecode. So if you've ever thrown a binary in something like IDA, uh, and, and you start to see the, the actual functions, the move functions and all of the pops and the pushes and everything, same thing for Java, essentially. Um, and just dump to ASCII. So it's really good. You should definitely get to know it. Here is some sample code in Smalley. Uh, we can see the first line. We've got class public hello world. This is creating our hello world class. We can see super Java Lang object. This is basically a hint that we're extending the generic Java object class. So if we were writing code, this would be hello world extends object. Uh, it, we declare a public method, main, static, returns void. We override that main function. Uh, we're gonna have two values that we're going to store, two registers. We have v0. Uh, v0 stores a reference to system.out. You can see Java Lang system, arrow to out. The actual second value is the, uh, the, the object type of that. So in this case, it's a Java IO print stream. Uh, then we store in v1, const string, hello world. Down below we see invoke virtual. Uh, we see v0, which we know is system.out. And we see v1, which we know is our string hello world. And then we see that on the print stream, we're using the function print line. So invoke virtual is basically just a function call. And now we see down below in comments, I've put a little sample as to what that would actually look like. System.out.println, hello world return void and method. So that is your crash course to this is Smalley. We're gonna look at some more of it, I'm sorry. So we're still looking for a needle. We've got all of this Smalley. It's interesting, uh, but there is way too much of it. Now, we don't know how this thing communicates with its C2. We don't know if it's binary protocol, if it's HTTP, it could be using something funky. All we really know is that it's capable of attacking HTTP services. So let's start looking at HTTP, uh, or let's start looking for HTTP as a, a token within the code, because you never know. Maybe, you know, this thing decomposes, or uh, decompiles and includes annotations and notes and other things. Maybe somewhere buried in there we can find HTTP and start to pick away at this. <laughs> what we didn't expect to find and found immediately were two uh, domains, axclick.store, uh, U and dot G. So if we look at where those strings were found, one is called exploration activity Smalley, not too suspicious. 
The other is found in services slash R-Y-I-I-D-R-X-C-J-M-F-B, which I don't know if you're familiar with malware naming, but that seems nothing like malware, right? Totally legit. So, first thing first, let's poke these. Let's see what they do. Uh, if we hit u.axclick.store, just simple curl, we get a 200 okay response, blank, never changes. We can hit it a thousand times, we always get a blank response with a 200 okay. Uh, if we hit g.axclick.store, we also get a 200 response. This time there's HTML. The HTML content is mostly blank, except for there is a single title tag, and in that title tag is a string, and that string changes every time we hit the server. So this is an example of what you would see. HTML title, uh, HTTPS slash slash, gobbledygook, HTTPS slash slash. So certainly looks like we've got at least two URLs here. We can tell that the second URL starts because we see the first HTTPS, um, and we can obviously tell that it starts with HTTPS. Now, if you look at this a little bit closer, something else jumps out at you. We also see S-N-E-W-X-W-R-I is repeated. Um, so that's pretty interesting because given the randomization of that string, it, it seems kind of weird that you would see repeats like that uh, if it were truly a random string. So then we start to come to conclusions. Clearly the first thing is URL. We don't know why, but we know it's a URL. The second string that is repeated, we're now assuming is a delimiter, and if we break up this title on that delimiter, all of a sudden those magical mix of characters in the middle are 26 alpha characters. Sounds a lot like the user agents we've been seeing in the attacks. So we're starting to feel pretty confident. We found the APKs for what we thought was a mobile botnet. In there we found a URL that points to a site, and in that site we've now got a title tag that contains URLs and a random 26 character string. So feeling like we're definitely honing in on the right, the right place. Uh, side note, if anybody has ever used the YRX bot Bitcoin app, I'm sorry that this happened. We had no idea it was named that. We named this YRX because of shuffling of the letters in this delimiter file or this delimiter value. There are some way more fun names in there, but we weren't allowed to use any of them. <laughs> so I, you can imagine, you can imagine. All right, so now we've found a URL in a file that was interesting. Uh, we found that that file is named very suspiciously. We've confirmed that what looks like the user agent is coming out of the title tag. Now let's find how this delimiter is gonna be used and where and potentially how these values get used if this is indeed a delimiter as we suspect it is. Uh, we grep for that delimiter, and now we see our same two files show up again. We see exploration activity. There's four versions of exploration activity, and we'll explain that in a second. Uh, this new adapter thing is new. Uh, the comp file is also new, but the services we see are very suspiciously named service again. So let's look into that service file. What we find in there is, and actually what we find in there and a lot of places, which is why we see so many files here, is we find a function that uses our delimiter as the first part of its function name. We see public s and new x w r i and then cc. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, verbiage relating to malware and botnets, but CC is command and control. So to see a function with our token and then CC at the end, that feels pretty good because now we suspected this thing was communicating with the CC in the first place based on all the observations we've made thus far and the guesses that we've made. So let's see what this thing's doing. Uh, we'll, we'll only focus on the blue lines just to save time and energy. Um, the first thing we see it do is that it is spinning up an Android WebKit web view, then it is using that web view to get the settings object. From that settings object, it's setting the cache mode to two. If you look up 
the value for what that means. It's a constant, means don't set cache. Uh, then it is setting v1 to the value of 1 and clearing the cache using that value. Uh, it is clearing the history on the web view. Then we see the actual reference to the g.ax click store. This is the URL that we suspect is giving the commands. We see it load that URL. Here's where it gets interesting. We see a new instance of services, our same file name with a dollar sign two at the end. We see the dollar sign two at the end version initted, and then we see it passed in. You can see it's stored in v1, and then v1 is passed in to the web view as a set web view client. So, what's the deal with the dollar signs? When APK tool decompiles APK files, you'll find there are the cases where a file you're looking at may have multiple named versions of itself delimited with a dollar sign sometimes multiple dollar signs. Uh, what's going on here is essentially when I'm writing my Java, I can put multiple class declarations in a single source file before compilation, and what APK tool is trying to do for sane management of my project is take those multiple classes and split them out into unique classes for management and organization purposes. So instead of seeing this massive wall of text for a single file, all of my subclasses get spun out. In this case, what we're observing here is that the developer declared their WebView client class inside of the same source file. It was compiled, and then when decompiled, it gets split out to its own thing. Now, we don't know that it's a WebView client yet, but we can make a pretty educated guess based on how we're seeing it used in the decompiled source. Uh, you know, we see dollar sign two init, and then we see it immediately set as the previous web view's own web view client. So what is a web view? A web view is basically a headless embedded browser instance. It's part of the Android OS. If you've ever used an app where, you know, you install the app and then you click on the little icon and it just loads the website, that's basically a web view. Uh, what is a web view client? A client uh, is basically a programmable interface for catching events and having programmatic hooks into a web view that has been declared. So just like in JavaScript, you can create an object and then you can catch the on load or on page load or whatever events, this is the WebKit uh, class for hooking into those events. So if we actually look into that dollar sign two file, where we suspect a WebView client is indeed being used, we confirm that there is one being used. Um, and the magic happens in the on-paged finished uh, event hook. So this event hook fires when a page is done loading. Obviously, that's very handy if you need to process the page. Uh, so what's going on here? Important to note is the first parameter passed in, P1, is a WebView. This is our web view that was just loaded with the C2 page. Uh, we see that that web view will then call get title. Uh, if we have a title tag, we will continue. Uh, we will call get title again. Now we see our delimiter, our S new XWRI is loaded into a V2. And then we're checking with a string contains that that string that is stored in our title tag contains our delimiter. If we do find instances of it, we continue. We get title again. We trim it for white space on the ends, and then we split it on our delimiter. Exactly what we expected. Perfect. So all of our, all of our wildest speculation and dreams are coming true. So we found our C2 for sure. All of our guesses, most of our guesses have been correct so far. Uh, we know that our initially suspected delimiter is indeed correct. Now we need to see how these values are being used. So these, this is for sure the C2, but we don't know which of these URLs is the target, what is the other URL for, we have no idea at this point. Uh, at this point though, we had already begun tracking that C2, uh, and we had, a, without a doubt, observed that URLs we were protecting 
and were actively under attack from these attackers were showing up in this C2. So, this is the S new XRII whatever. This is the attacking function. Uh, if you want to know how it DDoSes, this is where all the secrets lie. The first thing worth noting is the two declarations for X64. That's in hex, it comes out to a decimal 100. Uh, I had to strip a lot of this out of here to try and fit it onto slides, and even still, it spreads across like three slides, so there are parts missing. Just know that this was running in a loop. You can guess how many iterations it had. So, we spin up a new web instance, uh, sorry, web view instance. From that web view, we init it. We're also creating a new hash map. Uh, the hash map is interesting because it's basically the object type that is expected if you plan to override HTTP headers in a web view object. Uh, from there, we see map put, uh, but first we see the const string refer. So here we can figure out that we know that the three values passed in here, you see L Java lang string three times up there in the public function header declaration for the, the function itself, the method. And the P's map exactly to what you're thinking there. So P1, P2, P3. So we know that the third URL in this case is being shoved into the refer header of the web view that's going to be used for the attack. We see X requested with, which is an interesting header. This header is used by the app. It's built in and what it basically does, if you're using an embedded web view, the X requested with header ships with the name of the application that's doing the request. We can see here that the bad guy had thought about this. He blanks it, overwritten. Next we see uh, the request to get settings for the web view that we're about to use. And we see it enables JavaScript to make sure that we can bypass our real browser checks. Uh, next we're setting the user agent. We see here that they're setting v1 to p2. p2 we know is the user agent, it's the second value in the, the title that we showed and we know that has been split into an array before being passed into here. Or not split into an array, but chopped up and passed accordingly. Uh, we see that he clears the history. Not sure why exactly. I guess if you're browsing on your phone and you look in your history and all of a sudden there's all these sites you've never been to and there's thousands of pages for it, you might be a little suspicious. Um, he clears the form data. Also not sure why, but he does. Clears the cache. This one's obvious. Uh, if you're performing a DDoS attack and you're getting cache hits on your local device, you're failing. Don't do that. Well, actually, do do that. Do do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, then he clears the web view database from the local device. He wipes the web cache DB from the local device. Finally, he sets the cache mode to no caching. And then he loads the URL for the target. And here we can see he's loading P1 into V1. So we know that now we can absolutely positively confirm that the order and use for those values are what we thought they were. First one, target URL. Second one, user agent. Third one we now know is the referrer header that will show up in the HTTP headers for the attack traffic. Uh, creates a new instance of same file name, dollar sign three. We won't go into that. It was basically just an empty skeleton to catch errors and fail gracefully without throwing errors in the user's face because something went wrong. Um, and then we see add int and he increments v0. So essentially we're in a loop. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin up 100 web views we're gonna load them up with our target using the user agent we requested with blank requested with headers and a refer that we've specified from the C2 and send all that traffic at our poor, poor victims. So there we go. This is what we've, we now absolutely positively can confirm uh, is coming out of these malicious apps. This would be the pseudocode based on the uh, decompiled stuff that we just discussed. If you were 
more comfortable looking at it in something that resembles a real language. Uh, attack command parser extends WebView client on page finished, page title, get title. If it contains our delimiter, continue, uh, trim it, split it, pass it into our DDoS attack service, and DDoS attack service looks like this. Target user agent refer, uh, get your WebView headers, overwrite refer, blank your recs requested with header, uh, spin up 100 instances of a WebView in an array, loop over and inject your new WebViews into your existing array, make sure you override the settings and do everything, delete all your files, everything between sessions, continue onward. So, now that we know how this is being used, and this step, like I said, already happened, but it was still fun. Uh, basically, we just begin tracking this C2 nonstop, uh, and we did it over Tor, so if he blocked us, you know, we'd be back in five minutes. And uh, this allowed us to capture a lot of attack traffic, confirm attacks against our own customers, as well as uh, monitor real-time attack traffic against other people that we didn't know. So while we can say, hey, we know this thing's attacking us, it was also fun to say, hey, this thing's attacking them, and they're down. Okay, they're starting to come back up, and now they're changing stuff. So it was pretty cool to watch, I, I guess it would be Schimfreud or, it was fun to watch, but it was painful to watch at the same time, I guess. Yeah, fun, fun when it's not us. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun when it's not us. So what did we learn from watching the C2 for a considerable amount of time? Uh, we managed to capture over the course of, well, first of all, the timeline of this was it attacked us on the weekend, and by the next weekend, it was down. Or it was in the process of going down, uh, and in a little over seven days, it was completely down. So 386,000 attack commands were observed over that course that it was still up and running. Uh, of those... 386,000 attack commands, 17,000 of them targeted a unique domain and path combination. So just like we said, if they are active, they're actively monitoring you, and they're actively seeing if their attack is having impact, these guys attack 17,000 different things. And thousands of those same things or different things were across the same people. You know, if, if you were sitting over here and they're hammering your cart and you start putting some kind of mitigation in place that's protecting your cart and it starts to work, all of a sudden they start hammering your customer service form or your ticket system or anything else that they think might cause impact to your, your organization. Uh, of those 17,000 unique endpoints, there were only 61 domains that were targeted. So they attacked 17,000 things across 61 organizations. Uh, the targets included travel, which we know from first-hand experience. Uh, e-commerce, a very large e-commerce website named after a jungle, which is hilarious if you think about it. Yeah, let's attack them. They have so many servers that they give half of them away. I'm sure we can take them down with our botnet. Uh, file sharing, uh, torrenting stuff, prawn, always a hot target. Governments, um, gaming, I want to say these things, but I can't say them. So, okay. They, uh, they had 36,800 unique user agents overall that were used in their attacks. This includes the randomized ones. We found that if you hit them, uh, they were basically just shuffling that. You would always get a new unique one, even if they were hitting the same target. So it was like they had... Uh, a randomization script or some kind of function in the C2. Um, but more interesting is that if we omit all of those and we only look at ones that look like real valid user agents, we observed 8,492 user agents that looked super legit. Like it would be Opera coming from Windows XP, it would be Firefox on Windows 7, it would be FreeBSD running Chrome. Like, Super legit. You would never suspect that they were nefarious at all. 
Um, the attackers were very, very active in pivoting. Uh, they appeared to be, just as we were monitoring, it appeared that they were monitoring too, and as soon as they had impact, uh, and it, that impact started to go away, and the, the target recovered, they would pivot and start to make changes. How did this happen? So, basically this happened because they were name squatting on the Play Store. There are apps that you can get for APKs, or you can get APKs for, that are against the terms of service of Google's own Play Store, and therefore they cannot be had. So what they basically did was grab these apps, decompile them, shove their back doors in, upload them to the Play Store under a very uh, similar name that would hit on a search for an ignorant user. Uh, that ignorant user would install this application, and until Google caught on, it would sit there infecting people, and then once it was pulled, uh, that was it. It would stay on that user's device so long as they didn't uninstall it. How many, go look at your phone right now and you tell me how many apps you got there that you installed like one time, you've never looked at again. That's one of these guys. Um, so yeah, that was pretty much it. They would trash their accounts. They had multiple very shady accounts. The developer names were always just like 10 character, alphanumeric, random, and people still would just be like, I'm gonna install this, this seems good. Uh, here are some of the apps. Also interesting, we tried to test these in uh, the Android virtual device, the AVD stuff, and they didn't do anything. We had to actually go out, buy some crappy burner devices, throw them on ADB, and load these apps over ADB uh, via unknown sources, and then once we spun them up, we were able to actually get them to go. From there, we were able to spin up, um, throw them on Wi-Fi, and control DNS. Then we could trigger uh, replay attacks of previous attack commands and, and test moving fields around, changing values, seeing what this thing could do. Uh, if you looked at the permissions required, it, it needed full administration permissions, which what could go wrong. Uh, and it would spin up services in the background. So what does this mean? This means you got hot pockets. Uh, they ran in the background, that, so it didn't, the app didn't need to be running for this thing to run. Uh, as soon as you launched it the first time, it spun up a service, it did what it needed to do, and that service ran forever. Um, it would connect or attack using whatever connection it had. So you're in your car, you're driving to work, you're hopping across multiple wireless towers, you're getting new IPs, you're attacking all that time. You get to Starbucks, you're ordering your coffee, you're on their Wi-Fi, you're attacking all that time. You get to work, you're sitting in the conference room, you're bored, you're looking at your phone, your phone's hot, you don't know why, you're attacking all that time. You go home, you're on Wi-Fi, you've charged your phone three times a day, battery's still dying, you don't know why, it's attacking the whole time. Um, so this is part of the reason that we saw so much uh, traffic distribution and, and a lot of stuff coming out of this thing. Also, if you haven't tried cheeseburger lean pockets, they're delicious. Do it. Uh, I went the wrong way. Takedown, like I said, uh, the once we had figured this thing out and could absolutely positively confirm that it was an attacking source, uh, we notified Google. Google was super responsive. Uh, they began taking stuff down immediately. They identified lots of apps. They identified over 400 apps from the same developer, or at least based on trends related to that developer. And they were able to remove those apps from the Play Store and get them out of there using the new Play Protect features on some newer devices. They were also able to remotely uninstall the apps from infected devices. And the really cool part was if anybody else tried to download them or uninstall them from APK mirrors or anything else, you would be hit with this right in the face. App can be used to perform denial of service attacks against other systems and resources, yada, yada, yada. Please don't install this crap. Uh, after we went public, it was discovered that there were also UDP attack capabilities, which we did not see in some of the samples that we had found. Um, upon the discovery of that from 360CN, we did go back and look at our 24 something samples and like one or two of them did have these capabilities. We just missed it because there was so much other stuff. Uh, if you want more about that, google.goo.gl uh, slash 2UBTRX. Uh, there's a full write up there, same deal, picking it all apart, analyzing the source code. This was not just Akamai, it was a team effort. Uh, it involved Google, Team Comrie, RiskIQ, Cloudflare, Oracle, Flashpoint, Rory, 
and they all deserve high fives. Uh, some of the, all the guys in blue are some of the Akamai researchers and, and resources that helped, including this man right here, Dave McEwen, who's too afraid to get on stage, so I'm calling him out. Um, in red is uh, Miss, Miss Jamie Cochran. She recently passed away. She was an amazing researcher, and you should definitely Google her name. She was also an epic troll, uh, a troll that was so good they brought her on talk shows to troll people. So that's it. We've got 30 seconds. Q&A, go. Yeah. Code, um, you know, looking at the small e code, why did you not use like a dex to jar JD GUI or something so you could actually get it back? Were they doing some type of obfuscation or were you trying to do something that was programmably so you could do that across all the apps? Or? To be honest, for me, I had never really picked apart an APK before. And when I started looking into it, APK tool was the first thing that I found. And it, it did exactly what I needed on the first try. It got me visibility into the source code that I wouldn't have otherwise. And that was good enough. So if there are other tools, I should definitely look into them. But it was just the first one I found, and it worked well enough. So for, for future reference, so you can feed in the uh, APK tool to get a smallie. Then use dex to jar to get a jar, and then you can get from a jar file, you can use JD GUI and actually get full Java code. Oh, so then wow. you don't have to write your pseudo code, you could actually use the Somebody actual Somebody should JavaScript. just turn that into a single tool. Yeah. They should just make a script that you just <laughs> do that and it, it grabs all the depths and does it all. Yeah. Awesome. But, but still awesome stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? All right, I think we're all set. We made it in time. Good to go. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Nice job, guys. I'm going to hand.